Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you. Louder, can can I? Peace of the Lord be with you. Uh, yes. Today is the last Sunday in June, and I'm going to wrap up our June sermon series. Do you still remember what is our June sermon series? This whole month. Well, Yes, family life. Family life. Let me remember to click on my. It's not. Okay. Eh? Not on, huh? Now my. Ah, uh, come back first. Okay. So our our theme for this month is sound. Family life. I hope you remember we talk about the role of mother, the role of father, and role of parents. We really want to ask God to help us to build a family that is surrounded by God's guidance, His word, and His blessings. For some of us, our family may still struggling here and there, people whom we have been praying, our family members, still life has not changed yet. Of course, we do not expect them to change overnight. But every year in the month of June, where we dedicate the whole month emphasizing on family life, it is for us to hear from God's word over and over again how we play our own role, how we... Never give up, but extend grace and intercession for our loved ones. And some of us whom for our families are so blessed by God that your family members have strong bond, we will not take this for granted. We really want to give thanks for every of our family members and ask God to continue to help us to go stronger with our bond with each other, but also, more importantly, our relationship with God. And so this, this morning, uh, I'm going to wrap up this sermon series uh, with this sermon topic on uh, what a legacy. What a legacy. This, the text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 28, which you have heard being read just now. And this whole passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 28, if you have your Bible, I invite you to just turn to that passage. Because it paints a picture of a remarkable legacy that King David passed on to his son Solomon. We have to look at the, the background, some context of this passage, which we have just heard being read to us now. Chapter 28 is the last two chapters in the whole book of First Corinth, uh, Chronicles. And it <clears throat> begins with King Solomon's gathering his people together. It is his final speech to all the officials of Israel with Verse 2 to verse 8. He speak to them. And then from verse 9 to 10 and to verse 20, it is his public charge to his son Solomon. And if you have that passage open before you, what happened in, from verse 11 all the way to verse 19? This is a whole lot of very detailed practical instruction where David tells his son how to build a temple of the Lord. And he has prepared a lot of things, the plans, the details. He gave him clear instruction. Now, you see, David at this stage, he is in advance of age. His body is frail. He knows his time is coming to an end. Yet, at this point, he knows that is something important before he leave this world that 
God has given him to do. That is to pass on something to his son. So this public church, he gathered all the people. He did not do this in a private setting or even wait until his death bait and ask his son Solomon to come and say, I was wondering if I was given the chance to pass on some last words to my loved ones, what will I say? Or will I wait until the very last breath, gasping and just mumble, say a few words? But look at David. He didn't wait till that last moment. Whatever that is in him, he prepared while he still has strength. The Bible says he even stands up and say loudly, clearly. So if you have words of assurance, uh, words of comfort to your families, your loved ones, say when there is opportunity. Don't hold back. And here we see David. He knows that there are two important things that the Lord wants him to pass on to his son. One is to pass on to him the kingship. He is supposed to take over him as a king, to reign over Israel. And the second trust is to build the temple of the Lord. A huge undertaking. Never in their history that there is a concrete building built to worship God. All the time before this, it was tabernacles, moving centuries. And here, David in his heart, he wanted to build a temple for the Lord, but the Lord said, no, not in your lifetime. What you have to do is do all the preparation as much as you can and let your son do that. So this is where he was telling his son this two important things. Be a good, a king to rule over Israel and build the temple. But this two important trust, when you look at the legacy, when he instructed him, he didn't say much. If you look at the whole, whole chapter, he didn't say much. I think we have something to learn from David because to him, the work, the ministry is important, but something is more important. The foundation is more important. So in his instruction, in his charge to his son, we want to look, spend more time in verse 9 because the most tremendous work, words in this scripture are in verse 9. These are words every Christian parent ought to want for their children. These are words that every Christian ought to be praying for the struggling and hurting people in their lives. What are these words? I'm going to unpack this, this verse phrase by phrase. Here, it's David's exhortation to his son, Solomon. He encouraged him to, that the importance is that knowing God and serving him wholeheartedly, where he says in verse, first part of verse 9, and you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. I highlighted that two words. Know the Lord, know the God of your father and serve him. Do you real, realize that? He put knowing God before serving God. Sometimes we serve God without really growing in our knowledge of God. We, do, we know him a little bit, but we keep serving, serving. Here, David tells his son, the first important thing is you keep knowing God. 
so that you can keep serving, serving Him. We find the first essential principle of living a spiritual legacy. Know God and serve Him and do it wholeheartedly. So in other words, what is David telling his son with these two huge roles to play, but he wants him to look at what is more important, essential in life. He is telling his son that the secret of my success has been my relationship with God. We know that we are always, call, uh, the, the history, in history we call David as a man after God's heart. After God's heart. And in his whole lifetime, yes, he has his own weaknesses. And God used him. And he, his relationship with God is such an intimate and personal relationship with him. And so David at this point, he tells his son that, the secret of my success has been my relationship with God. It is all about having a living faith and a, an intimate relationship with God. Therefore, you, my son, also need to pursue and build the same relationship. Know the Lord of your father and serve him. He is my God. He is also your God. Know Him. Know Him. So this knowing is not just a head knowledge. Knowing in the biblical term means really coming before each other openly, even naked, so that we can really have this no secret between the two of us. Know God. For David to be able to, to emphasize on this, it shows that he has this treasured, precious relationship with God. He pre treasured this so much that he knows when I pass Baton, I want to tell him this very important thing first. We are called to know God. I was, uh, the God our spiritual parents knew and passed the faith on to the next generations. This is a crucial starting point. God gives us each a free will. He gives us this free will to choose. In our life, there are so many things that try to draw our attention to pursue over. This free will God has put in us, but with this free will, God also put in every one of us a desire to seek for something real, something beautiful, something authentic, and have eternal, everlasting effect. So this desire that God has put in us has caused human to look for something greater and who is something greater than our God this desire if we become so busy in our life just jumping from one one thing to another thing without getting in touch with this inner desire we will not pay attention and we there will not be room for us to really allow the Holy Spirit to knock in us, to channel us back to God. So David is telling his son that, yes, these are important, but don't be too overwhelmed. You need to exercise your free will and know that desire to seek God. And so we need, what we need to do is to allow our will to conform to God's desire. We came, many of us come, came back from our church camp. This time our church camp, the theme is on be awakened. Awakened to know that there, there is something very important. This relationship with God is the basic. And to align 
align with God's, conform with God's heart, God's plan. So David is telling him, Solomon, do this. He wants to see this in Solomon. And so my dear brothers and sisters, as we build our spiritual legacies, let us remember that our faith is not built on any accomplishments alone or built on experiences of others, but on our personal connection with God. How is your relationship with God? How connected are we with our God? And let us be with our prayers that on this close last uh, Sunday service or to wrap up the, the family life, we, our prayer have to continue to be on asking God to help us build a faith-filled family grounded in God's Word, engaging with God's Word, listening to Him, reading His Word daily as parents, as individuals, lead your children, and our young people here, they are still single, but start to build this relationship with God first so that we all have this, we treasure this, and we have something to share, to testify, to pass on to others. We want to pray that God will be, His name will be highly lifted up in our life. And so at this moment, I would like us to pause and pray for your own family. Pray for yourself that the Lord will help me to, to build this intimate, personal relationship with Him. And my family, each and every one of them, will come to know God in such a personal way. Pray for your family, your extended families. And if you are single, so pray for your spiritual children. Let us spend some time praying. Lord, we commit our loved ones one by one. We commit them by naming them before you. And ask that, Lord, you will keep them in your truth and in your love. Lord, let this grace flow in, in our family from this generations to next generations, that we will know you and are so willing to serve you. Lord, do this work that only your spirit can do in each of our loved one's life. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember this prayer, your prayer. Every time, every worship service, when you come, if God remind you of your families, your loved ones, just remember this prayer. And in our Holy Communion, when you're partaking of the Holy Communion, you remember that when, when you receive God's grace, means of grace through the partaking of the bread and the cup. Pray for your loved ones. Bless them in the name of Jesus. And I believe if we keep them in our prayer, the Lord loves us them more than we do. He will in his own way, his own time, do his work in their lives. And so continue on. David exhorts Solomon not only to know God but to serve him wholeheartedly and willingly. Wholeheartedly and willingly. 
our spiritual legacies are built on a foundation of serving God wholeheartedly, and it is different from serving God half-heartedly. Can you tell what's the difference in, in our own life, in our own work? Can you tell when do you really do it wholeheartedly and when do you do it half-heartedly? I observe and I realize that in, in workplace, many people work just a half heart. I hope I'm wrong. Let me know if I'm wrong. When they do not enjoy their job or some major aspect of the job, many of us just do for the sake of work, work for work's sake and just mother along and do the bare minimum. My boss asked me to do this. Okay, Lord, I just do this part. We do not really put our heart in and, and put our effort in to do some, do it well. Does it sound familiar? Sometimes I realize that uh, when I have too many things on my plate, uh, someone asked me to do something. Okay, Lord, wait, wait. Uh, I uh, no, 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 still clear the rubbish, clear the rubbish. Oh yeah, quickly just do, without checking and see cleaning the, the, the rubbish bin. I just do my bare minimum. This is human. So sometimes, if we allow our our uh, life to just respond to things half-heartedly, and becomes a habit, this is no good. To our life. We need to check, do I do things wholeheartedly or just half-heartedly? And this, if we do not pay attention, this attitude will also creep into the way we have our church life, ministry life in church. Because in church, Sometimes, some people serve not because they are willing to do so or not because they have heard God's call and respond to God's call. They serve because they are embarrassed to say no to others. And people say, hey, we need, we need someone uh, to, to come and sign on to do this, do that. And because my, uh, someone asked me to do so or my self leader or... Uh, was still pastor come to, to, to ask me I say no I, 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 I dare not say no so I just bite the bullet and do it many of us begin in this I when I look back in my own ministry I, because at first we uh, tremble I, I, I'm not sure whether I, I'm able to do that or not I, uh, 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 I can do it well or not so since you asked that, okay, okay, I bite the bullet. But don't stop there. I think the, the, the trembling heart shouldn't affect us from continue to serve God half-heartedly. We have to ask God, since I have agreed to serve in this area, Lord, help me to know how to offer my all, offer my best to the task that you have given me. It's still the heart attitude. It's still the heart attitude. And if we are not aware, many of us just live life cruising along. And in, in John Wesley's term, he called this type of lifestyle, this type of Christian, he gave it a term. He called them almost Christian. Have you come across this term? The almost Christian. In one of his ser sermons on Christian discipleship, he describes that there are generally two kinds of Christians, and almost Christian and an altogether Christian. By just looking at these two terms, can you tell what's the difference? Almost Christian, 差不多, 差不多, aga, aga, 就够了了, aga, aga. 
the altogether Christian give it all wholeheartedly. And there's a difference, great difference between these two. In a nutshell, I, I, I encourage you, if you can, you Google search this sermon. His, this sermon is very important sermon. A lot of good illustration. When I, when I read this sermon, it is a, a really wake-up call for me. Because the way he described an almost Christians, hey, many times I see that happen to me, you know. And in a nutshell, what's the difference? He actually is saying that while an almost Christian lives an outwardly Christian life in every way, lives, attend worship, serve, pray, read the Bible, be kind to others. Yes, an outward Christian life in every way that, that looks like a Christian. But then, what's the difference between this almost Christian and altogether Christian? And altogether, altogether Christian in John Wesley's word, he says, adds on to this outward Christian living, love for God and neighbor. It is this love that moves a Christian to live the outward lifestyle your service, your attitudes, your, no, your uh, works. It's, that is because I do this because of my love for God, my expression of my love for God and for others. And, and all, all together Christians also adds to this, the genuine devotion to God. Trust God and have confidence and know that God will, take, will bless us beyond my own ability. And so a, an almost Christian, based on the grace of Jesus Christ, not just on outward life. So in, in his sermon, John Wesley was telling Christians in his time that examine yourself always, not to be deceived by just your outward living. No? Thinking that I come to church every Sunday, I attend a cell group, then I, I'm a Christian. He said, yes, but not so yet. You are still, if the heart is not, the attitude is not right, it is not motivated by genuine love, you are just an almost Christian. Almost Christian. So although people cannot fully see into another person's mind and understanding uh, and understand the true motives behind their actions, these people may look good on the outside but lost focus on the inside. If we are not motivated or nurtured by love, that focus in our inner life, you may lose it. And therefore sometimes, I hear people sharing with me, I have a successful life, good job. I, do, I try to do uh, some good work, good deeds. But sometimes when I'm alone, I just feel that something is still missing. There is no real contentment. No real joy in me. There's something missing, something missing. Have you come across sometimes in your life that you, you know that you, you are doing some, some good work? Not that you are a bad guy, you deliberately do something uh, against God's will. You do. But you know that it's not really fulfilled. And so, when you... There is days or there is time where this type of, of feeling surface. My dear brothers and sisters, may I urge you not to shun this away too quickly. Not to suppress it. Be bold enough to sit with it and come before the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal, Lord, what is it? What is this dissatisfaction? 
why does this feeling of uneasiness, there, yet not quite there, why does it keep praying, keep praying? Because when we seek Him, He will be found. And so, with this, David knows the importance of this. He tells Solomon, when you go face such things, the Lord sees every heart and understands every plan and thought. New Living Translation. He knows. He sees. He knows our heart. People will just see our outward living, but God knows. We may fool ourselves thinking how pure we are and how sincere our intentions are, but God knows. God says that if you seek Him, you will find Him. And so we ask ourselves, how much uh, am I putting into seeking and knowing God? In my daily life, in my years of progress, growth as a Christian, are you doing it with every part of your heart and life? Or are you just going through the motions and giving it only a partial effort? We have to ask God to help us. I don't want to be an almost Christian. Since I'm a Christian, help me to grow. Grow into perfection to be an altogether Christian. This is his, in his sermon. He is urging, John Wesley, urging Christians to be and grow to be an altogether Christians. And David continues to say, if you seek him, seek God, he will be found. So when we find that something is, is not there yet, Lord, what is it? How to live a life of in fulfillment where Jesus promised that uh, and he comes, he not only gives life, but life abundantly, to live a life abundantly. So we want that. So we seek him. And David tells Solomon, his son, God will be found by you. And Jesus, in his, his teaching on the Sermon of the Mount, a thousand years later, he emphasized these same important principles. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will be fine. Uh, you will find. Seek. So, my brothers and sisters, this first point where David tells his son, he had to pass a legacy, a spiritual heritage. He did not tell him, wow, well, now you'll be a king. I have lived so much of the treasure, gold and, and, and silver for you. No, he said, I live with you. This very important relationship with God. Seek him, know him, serve him wholeheartedly and willingly. So this is the first part. And having told the, his son this, he wished that the second thing he would tell him is that, my son, you, having heard this, step up and step out in faith. We wish that our, our children, our next generations, will be able to learn from God and step up and step out in faith to take on whatever God wants him or her to, to do in the, their lifetime. So David goes on to say, when you take up this robe, verse 20, be strong and courageous and do it. Be strong and courageous to do it. It's not just a hard matter. Okay, I know God, I, I love him, I will so be strong. That is from verse 11 to verse 19. This second important task that is given to him, build the temple of the Lord. Do it. You have to do it. Don't be afraid. Where there are challenges, there are enemies will come and, and you will face a lot of, of, of uh, different, different views, opinions. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. Now you see, my dear brothers and sisters, in addition to the spiritual dimensions of his legacy, David instills 
confidence and encouragement in Solomon. So whenever we encourage people to come, serve, serve the Lord well, with this ministry, this way, when we encourage them to come on board, remember to instill confidence and encouragement. Tell them that do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, is with you. So not you, you take on not because I say embarrassed to, to, to say no. You take on because the Lord is with you. We each serve because of our God. David here echoes God's exhortation to Joshua before he led the people of God into the promised land. Remember this? Be strong and courageous. Sound familiar? In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, the Lord repeats twice to this young Joshua, ask him to be strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. This was appropriate because Moses was a great leader who could only lead the people of Israel to a certain point. However great the leader, you have come to this point. The rest was up to Joshua. You have to pass Peter to someone else. The same pattern applied to David and his successor, Solomon. Now he must pass Peter. So when we serve the Lord, when we, when we live this life, there are times where we are given active role. Do it. Be courageous, be strong, courageous, and do it. But when times is up, don't just keep hanging on there. Refuse to release and empower others to do that, to continue the work. So David passed Baton to his son and asked him to step up and step out in faith. Take on this Baton. He encourages his son to be strong. And un as he undertakes the task of building the temple, assuring him that God will be with him throughout the process. So David's unwavering belief in God's presence and support becomes part of the legacy he imparts to Solomon. While building the temple and God's work is important. Yes, this is important. Huge task, huge undertaking. David does not want Solomon to put the cart before the horse. He continues to say this. I want to draw your attention to what? He's, he don't want to put the, the, the cart before the horse because the spirit in which you serve God is more important than the work itself. Think about this. The spirit, the heart, our relationship, the motivation that we serve, the spirit in which you serve God, it's more important than the work itself. My prayer is always that, Lord, when we in SKMC continue our next lap, next 30 years, well, after we renew our land lease, but this land lease is a huge fundraising project. But every one of us, we need to have the right spirit first. The spirit has to be right so that we serve God willingly, wholeheartedly. No one is being forced into it. No one will, see, will, will, will just do it because I'm embarrassed that they're not uh, paisay because everyone is serving, so I, I must also serve. No, we all have that right heart. And in, in doing so, you will, some of us will, will notice that we in our church, we begin to reclaim the ethos and importance of class meeting in John Wesley time. How does he put the people together? Help each other to have an accountable relationship with God. To talk about our awareness of God's presence in our daily life and how we respond in our growth into holiness. So we have to reclaim. We, the, the, the pastoral team and our leaders and sound leaders, we are going through this. And soon we will uh, 
let our cell members and the rest of you to come in so that we all learn. We want to ha- ask God to help us to put our spirit right first. So that when we do His work, we do it joyfully, willingly, wholeheartedly. My dear brothers and sisters, once the heart is right, just do it. Your, but your heart has to be right first. And all Solomon needs to do is to accept the task, be strong and courageous to do it. Solomon needs to step up and step up in faith. Likewise, we need firm faith and courage as we build our spiritual legacy. Yes, we may face challenges, hardships and uncertainties, but we can trust God to be with us and support us. We need to pray. A lot of prayer need to put in when we continue this journey, when we take on. Some of us, actually, most of us, we have these two roles. We have the role of uh, David and the role of Solomon. When you are David, you live a life experiencing God so that you know how to pass the baton, empower someone else to step up and step up in faith. And we are also Solomon. We learn from others. We learn from God. We learn from our spiritual parents, their faith, their life legacy, and encourage us to continue on this work with boldness and courage and have faith in the Lord. And so in conclusion, what a legacy we see in David's exhortation to Solomon. His devotion to God and his desire to see his son succeed in fulfilling the purposes of the Lord is a legacy that echoes through the generations. I pray that here in SKMC, we all, when we pass Baton, when we work, serve together with our brothers and sisters, this, what is that that is passing? It's that heart. It's the relationship with God. It's the love for God, the love for His people. Work, ministry, is an expression of this inner life. I pray that we all have it right. Take that. This is the, the heritage, the legacy that we want to carry on so that we can also seek God wholeheartedly, faithfully carry out our kingdom assignments and pass on the baton to the next generation. So, are you ready to be an altogether Christian? If you forget anything, remember, I do. Lord, have mercy on me if for many years in your term, in your eyes, I'm just an almost Christian. Help me. I want to grow to become an altogether Christians. May our children and future generations find a spiritual legacy through our life testimonies. May God and future generations find us faithful And this song that we are going to sing as a response, let it be our prayer. Each and every one of us pray. Pray that Lord find us faithful in our walk with you. Let's stand. We're pilgrims on a journey of a narrow road And those who've gone before us lie the way Cheering on the faithful Encouraging the weary Their lives a living testament To God's sustaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses Let us run the race not only for the prize 
But as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness. Pass on through godly love. that we live lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey oh may all who come behind us find us faithful after all our hopes and dreams have come children see true all with love behind may the clues they did discover and the memories they uncover may the light that leads them leads them to the road we each must find our sincere prayer we pray for ourselves that you will keep us faithful and we pray that others will see it in our life testimony that you are a true and living God and they will find us faithful and they too our family members our generations after generations will follow this same path and remain faithful to you Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. 